Here's to hoping this thing doesn't mess, get messed up. All right, there we go. So I'm late again. So we, we proceed with lecture series number number 16 today, where we, we start our discussion of number systems and representation, really. We're supposed to have started this on Monday, but people didn't want to. Now, I, I thought I'd start off by a rant here. I thought we had a discussion about only two people have, only two people have bothered to scan the results of their scripts and share them with us. We don't know what the others are waiting for. Um, it's very strange here, right? Sometimes when you're taught to do something and you don't know why you're taught to do it, it's best to follow the instructions, but hey. So we'll start off with, uh, just, this is a lecture outline, right? Just a, a brief introduction um, to this whole thing we are calling number systems and representation. And I've always thought, right? I deliberately asked us last time to say, why are we doing computer architecture, try and see? if people know why we're doing this. So I thought it would be nice for us to, nothing to do with what we're doing computer architecture, but why we are studying number representations. Look at a few scenarios, usage scenarios, um, and then we'll jump right straight into um, these three number systems that we're going to, to look at, right? So base 10, well, I guess revision from primary school, and then we'll look at base 16 and base two, right? Incidentally, there are other, there are other number systems out there. Right. <clears throat> so I mean, we've been singing this song over and over again. Uh, we now know that uh, numeric information is extremely important to computers, right? And, and, and the specific type of numeric information that a computer is best able to make sense out of is the binary number system. But we need a way to efficiently store this numeric information, right? For the purposes of the people that are the human beings that is that are going to be um, trying or wanting to make sense out of the numerical representation, and also from from the perspective of the computer, which is eventually going to um, to have to to interpret the, the information encoded in whatever file you'll be working with. Right. Uh, right. So even though we are storing this, we typically store data that is processed by a computer in in binary format. But for human beings to be able to, to really make uh, good sense out of the information, obviously it has to be presented in a human readable format, right? So typically it's things like base 10 and base 16, right? So hexadecimal format or uh, decimal format. Decimal format for obvious reasons, right? I mean, we are, we are born, uh, well, we, we've been indoctrinated into thinking that working with 10 digits makes more sense than any other number system, right? And apparently, not apparent, I think this is, there's a logical reason to this, right? 10 fingers. I don't know, if there are those of us that are not fortunate enough not have 10 fingers, but that's why the decimal, deci, right? 10 fingers. Um, but it turns out that as you scale up, as you, are, as you start dealing with larger numbers, it becomes extremely difficult for you to make use of um, a decimal format, right? Which is when the hexadecimal actually comes into play. Um, and it turns out that, uh, representing information in hexadecimal format is very useful when you're trying to convert from binary to something that a human being can easily make sense out of. You soon see that uh, for, for a binary number that uses eight bit representation, for instance, instead of you using eight bits, you can literally use just two hexadecimal numbers, right? Because each, um, well, Four, four, four of the eight bits in your eight bit encoded representation uh, is the equivalent of one uh, hexadecimal number, right? A nibble, apparently, right? So we'll see that. Um, so a reminder here on examples, right? And, and I thought we'd start this by, by, by going back to what we did last term, right? There, there's this, notion of uh, permissions in Unix that we discussed at length, and it turns out that the, the permissions, the numbers, remember the numbers, the, the uh, 0, 4, 2, 1, and 0, right? They have significance, reading, writing, and execution, and they're not permission at all. It turns out that these numbers are actually represented using um, the octal number system, so base eight, right? And I know we're not discussing the octal, but I just thought we'd get an appreciation of 
um, specific examples where these number systems are used, right? And we know that it's octal format because if you remember our discussion of this three by three matrix, what we realized was that um, at a bare minimum, you could represent a permission um, with a zero, implying that no permission has been granted at all. And then at the most, you can, have, you can only have what? A seven as the maximum, right? Zero to seven gives you a total of eight, right? So you are playing around with eight digits which is uh, base eight, octal number system. Right? So classic example of where um, the octal number system is, is actually used. I just thought people would, uh, would remind themselves about this. It might come back when you're dealing with computer security next, next term. Um, so there's this notion of, I don't know if uh, we've discussed this with uh, Edward already uh, in computer networks. Um, when you're discussing the internet, you now know that uh, Computers, well, my computer has a name obviously, right? But, but if I'm communicating with another computer on the network, it has no way of trying to make sense out of the human readable name that I've given my computer, right? Um, but, what is, but what it is able to make sense out of is these things they call IP addresses, right? So internet protocol addresses, right? Um, and they look, something similar to the numbers that I've, I've highlighted there, right? So these are usually represented using what they call dotted decimal format or dotted hexadecimal format these days. Uh, dotted decimal format is used for, I guess, what they call IP version four, which is the most widely used version, right? So these numbers here, all of the highlighted numbers here use uh, dotted decimal format, IPv4, right? So you have, um, groups of numbers, these are decimal numbers separated by a dot. Um, so using this particular unique identifier for my computer, I can easily com uh, communicate with uh, a computer on the UNSA network or on the internet. Right. Um, and it turns out that we use a dotted decimal format so that we can easily read the IP address. But what the computer does behind the scenes is it converts these decimal numbers, for instance, into equivalent binary numbers, right? Ones and zeros, right? Uh, the, the same goes for the so-called IPv6, and surely I, I do hope Edward has told us why we've, we are gradually transitioning into, um, we're gradually transitioning to using IPv6 instead of IPv4. IP addresses are gonna have to run out at some stage, right? The IPv4, right? And so, um, Vision 6 makes it possible for us to actually have a lot more addresses. And it turns out that, uh, because of the same interesting things that Edward has told us, it turns out that the reason why we are running out of IPv4 IP addresses is because um, increasingly there are more and more devices that are being, that are finding themselves on the internet, right? There's this notion of the internet of things now. People are connecting weird things to the internet. You know, you can connect your refrigerator to the internet, you know, you, you are running, I don't know what those devices or gadgets uh, are called, um, but you can literally connect that device to the internet, right? Like when you're running and you're trying to keep track of how fast you are running or how many kilometers you've covered. You know those bands, right, that people use, right? All those weird things are being connected to the internet now, and there's more actually out there. So the fact that more and more devices and gadgets are being connected to the internet means that we will end up with a situation where we're using up a lot more um, IP addresses. I have to run out of some states. So this is why we are using IPv6. And because IPv6 uses um, um, a slightly larger range, um, the representation of the addresses does not use dotted decimal format, but instead it uses dotted hexadecimal format. Right? Uh, year number four, there is, uh, I think there is, um, what they call, is it uh, computer networking and data communication or something? So you, you, get to, you get to appreciate what we're talking about right now. But it turns out that one of the concepts that you're going to cover is this whole notion of subnetting where you, you create uh, sections within a network, right? So if you look at the UNSA network as a whole, they, the people at CICT have actually created uh, what they call subnets, right? So, uh, you could have a subnet, right? A particular network dedicated to what? Remember DAS and NAS? 
the dust and dust thing we discussed last time. So you could have a dedicated sub network that is going to, to be forward for storage infrastructure, right? Because you want that particular network to be much faster. You want to isolate it from the more, from the more congested network that is used by the 30,000 plus students at UNSA. It gets even better, right? Uh, if you go somewhere near central administration, I'm sure those people, right, forget about animals being equal here, I'm sure those people have access to an isolated network that is much faster. Much faster than the network that you use when you're connecting to those network using Edurom, for instance. Uh, and for the few that have come to my office, I've shown you this, right? When we're downloading that one GB, I don't know where it is. We're downloading a file, and they were surprised that we downloaded it within like a few minutes, right? It was, uh, it was a huge file, really. It turns out that downloading it on the same user network, but using, uh, on a different sub-network, um, uses a much slower speed, right? So those things are, those machines that, are, that you typically use on a network are located on different regions called sub-networks. Subnetwork, okay, subnetworks or subnets, right? Um, for you to get the process where you create those subnetworks, you must understand what I'm talking about here, right? And so you get to start playing around with the actual bits, the ones and zeros, actually. It gets even better. Yes, sir. On the IP addresses, do you use them as a different part of the machine or the network provider? Well, it turns out that there are bodies out there that have been uh, put in place to authority figures, right? authorities that have been set up to, um, to issue these, these network addresses. It's an interesting question actually, because if you look at this particular example, these IP addresses that you're seeing are for a server, right, a server computer system, which hosts uh, our list website, which is incomplete. Uh, but you'll notice that the, this, this is the public IP address that the outside world Sees out there, right? So when they're trying to access whatever service we have on the list server, the list.unza.zm server, they access that service using this IP address. But internally, so there's a body out there, right, which issues you with, uh, depending on how large your organization is, they'll tell you to say, um, we'll give you this particular range so you can, you, can, you can allocate IP addresses on your network using this range. But because UNSA is so large, my machine right now does not have a publicly accessible IP address. It has what they call an internal IP address, unique within the UNSA network. Whenever I'm communicating with somebody else outside of the network, I use one of the publicly available IP addresses associated with the UNSA. Oh, yes. So, the, um, I guess it's, is it I, 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 Nick, I, Nick, or I, I Nick or something? There's an, there's an authority, there's a body, there's an organization responsible for this. Just like there's an organization responsible for registering domain names. Yes, sir? So each individual machine has uh, a different IP address regardless of what you No, you can't. You can't. Each, each, each machine, each computer, whenever you connect to the MTN network or Airtel network using data, you can check this out actually. You have an IP address certificate. You can go to the about of your phone, right? Go to about phone and then you can check your IP address. It's unique and it's dynamic because every time you, you're not connected to the internet, what, 24 seven, every time you connect to the, uh, to the network, obviously like you'll be issued with a new IP address. But we're not here to talk about IP addresses. We're just uh, trying to emphasize the fact that these are applications. No, we're not talking about IP addresses, are we? We're talking about number systems. Let's not lose track of what why we are here. It gets even better, right? Other applications of number systems, there are, um, so there's this notion of what they call crypt crypt cryptographic hash functions that are prevalent these days. Usually this is applicable um, to uh, security applications, right? Um, but it turns out that they have other applications for Software like, uh, I don't know if people have heard of version control software like Git, for instance. Um, Git is just a, a simple software tool that allows you to keep track of um, the progression of whatever project you would be working on, you might be working on. And this is usually, um, I guess, projects that involve some sort of uh, programming or software development, right? So 
let's say you are working on a large project, right? Perhaps alone or with other people. Every time you make a change, a significant change to that project, what you do is you save the state of that project in a certain special way, by specifying, you commit the changes, right? To save the project. And it turns out that each, each point, each save point that you're creating has an associated commit message, right? Which is like this thing that you're seeing here. Now it turns out that uh, Git uses what they call a SHA-1 uh, algorithm, right? Uh, apparently, it's a secure hash algorithm, you know, one. There's one, two, I don't know, three or four or something. But the way SHA-1, the way the SHA-1 uh, algorithm works is it generates a 160-bit uh, ID, right? Message digest, they call it. But imagine what you'd have to go through if you were to to use the ones and zeros, 160 characters, right? It would be insane. So it makes sense that you instead use the equivalent what? Hexadecimal representation of the 160 characters that you'd be working with, right? So instead of 160, I do believe these are like 60. Instead of 160, you end up using um, 60 characters instead, right? And you'd be thinking, but who cares? What if I, I want to use the bits? Turns out that this commit message is really important as you're working with, um, as you're visioning your, your, your project, right? You might want to roll back to a previous state. For you to do that, you need to specify which commit ID you want to roll back to. You might want to branch out from a particular um, message digest or commit ID. You need to specify that ID. It, life becomes a lot easier when you specify 60 characters as opposed to 160 characters. That's what we're saying, right? I don't know. Is this making sense? No. no. Sorry? I don't know where you are. Where did this start from? Where are we right now? These are examples. Look at this, right? So if you look at Git, right? <laughs> if you look at, if you look, what I'm saying about Git, oh, the way Git works is, uh, let me just show you just now. Git, Git is a software application, right? It's application software. It's application software that you use to, let me just show you. It's application software that you use to version control, to version control whatever software project or project you might be working on. So, uh, for instance, in my case, there's this project that I've been working on since, since when? Since April 6th. I don't know if people can see here, it was a Saturday, right? So from the time I started, I started the, uh, is it me or can people see? Hopefully. From the time I started this project on April 6th, every time I was making a change, I, every time I make a significant change, I save the state of the project so that I continue from where I stopped from, right? So I'm vision controlling the, um, the project itself, right? So I started on April 6, April 7, there's a time stamp as well here. April 7, I did something else, something significant, I saved the state. All the way up to right now, right? So, the, the way I'm saving the state is I specify, I commit the change, and when I commit a change, each change is associated with a unique ID. But the unique ID is represented by the software using hexadecimal format, that's what I'm trying to say. Internally though, internally, this, this um, commit message that I'm talking about, internally it's represented like so. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so internally, uh, uh, how many how many thirty twos are we supposed to have for one hundred and sixty characters? Five, right? Internally, what Git does is each of those each 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 one of these message digests I'm talking about this. What the software does is it uniquely identifies them like so. So each particular message is the equivalent of this. It's this long. 
So what I'm saying that this is not going to be very helpful to whoever is using this piece of software, right? So it makes sense that this particular representation, this stream of numbers is converted into a form that human beings can easily interpret. And lo and behold, hexadecimal format comes to the rescue. We are looking at examples where number systems are useful to human beings, right? Why are they letters? It's a number system though. It's just a number system. What do you mean why are they letters? We discussed them just now, but it turns out that the way it's base 16, and the way base 16 works is you first of all use zero to nine, this is like the equivalent of base 10, and then the remaining eight to, is it F, uh, a kind of like uh, uh, alphabetical letters, right? So you notice that these, these commit messages that I'm talking about here, it's a combination of, it's not just letters, it's a combination of uh, letters and numbers. Can you see a two there, two F somewhere there? Two F six C D, right? Okay. So examples, right, of where number systems are quite useful. And it turns out that there are a number of these, of such examples. Incidentally, when you, you start covering 2021, 2022, I think, computer security, I do believe you are going to have a discussion of the various cryptographic hash functions that are available out there. So SHA-1, SHA-2, it turns out this, this is not um, that reliable these days. So I think circa 2005, they stopped using this. It's not as common in use as it used to be, right? All right, so I was just showing you uh, the commit messages there. Well, those are uh, and then, again, still application of these things. Once we start using Qt Spim, you notice that uh, the interface that we'll be using allows you to view the, the CPU state. By the way, this is the state of the registers, 32 registers. It allows you to view the state of the registers either using uh, base 10, which is decimal number system, uh, base 16, hexadecimal, or base two, binary, right? Um, so by the time we start using Qt Spim, obviously be able to make better sense out of what's happening irrespective of which number system you want to use. Um, and then, once we, we have a discussion about how data is represented, you gain an appreciation of, of how uh, things like colors and, and images uh, are represented by a computer, right? It turns out that these things we call colors are nothing more than, uh, usually, if you're using the RGB format, for instance, you are, you are playing around with uh, numeric values associated with red, green, um, RGB, and blue, right? Um, so if you want purple, you can, you, can, you can combine those three colors to derive purple, for instance, right? And it turns out that these colors can be represented in so many different ways, right? You can either represent them using decimal format, using hexadecimal format, right, or binary format. When you start your discussion of web development, I don't know if Malim is teaching you that, you, you will notice that for When you are when you are when you are when you are working with colors during web development, um, hope people can use can see this. I'm trying to to see if I can change the background color just to show you exactly how. Um, I don't know if people can see. Oh, there we go. So current this is the background color. Let's change it to black, right? Instead of uh, three Fs here, I'm, I'm just I'm changing this value here. I don't know if people can see it. It's it's shown as a pound and then three Fs, right? Uh, but I can change it. To, have you seen that it's changing up there? Yeah. Previously it was F F F, right? But I changed it to zero 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 is black, right? Something, right? Yeah, so these are, I guess, simple examples. There are so many examples, simple examples of where you will find these, these, um, these numbers. And you'll be wondering, what is FFF? Oh, I know what it is. Usually, I mean, if you play around creating those memes with Photoshop, for instance, I do believe when you're, I know people get away with it by just using a color pick or something, but you can, you can actually change the colors of whatever image you're playing around with by just using hex values. 
So zero all the way to F are the numbers you're playing around with essentially. Right. Um, and then once we have a discussion of image, you notice that the images are nothing more than a representation of, and I don't know if this is very clear, but if you, if you blow it out, you notice that the, the image, right, if it's a high resolution image, the more you zoom in, you can literally see the, the pixels associated with the image itself, right? And it turns out that uh, the way a computer represents that image is just using ones and zeros associated with each individual pixel, the image, right? Um, and, then, and then once we have a discussion of, uh, of how a computer knows A's and B's and whatnot, again, it would be like a classic example of like um, um, uh, usage of uh, so-called number system. Usually you, you'd be, when you're dealing with ASCII, you typically come up with a, um, what they call an ASCII table and it will represent the things that you find on your key keyboard in hex and in binary, although this thing doesn't have the binary equivalent. It's just, decimal and hex, but typically there'll be a binary representation as well, right? So everything um, is the equivalent of each of the three number system, decimal, um, decimal hex, and, and binary, right? Including the space. Okay, so a reminder here of uh, this so-called decimal representation, right? It's nothing more than, I mean, it's in use because um, we are used to it, um, and typically what you're playing around with is just 10 digits, zero through nine, right? Um, and as you transition beyond nine, all you're doing is padding, um, you, you introduce additional digits and then you pad them using this same nine D or this same 10 digits, right? Uh, 10, 11, 12, one and two, one and three. And these are just symbols, by the way. It's symbols, everything is just symbols, right? Okay, I mean, we don't have to, everybody knows how to work with this 10 here. I mean, I'll be surprised why, how you found yourself here if you don't know how to. But, but uh, so this, yeah, not base 10. Everybody knows how to do base 10, right? How do you go to a shop and tell them, say I want that, that particular item worth 2,000 quarter or 200 quarter, right? Because you know base 10, right? Um, so, so, uh, and by the way, we're not covering octal base eight here because it's irrelevant for us, but you cover it in computer, computational mathematics with whoever is gonna teach you next term. We're just interested in three types of number systems. Sorry? We are not, we are, there's a reason why we are looking at these three number systems. If you want, we can look at octal, but what's the point, right? So the reason we are looking at base, base 10 is because when we are writing, when we start writing these assembly language kind of programs, for the most part, the values, the states of the registers will be specified using what? Decimal values, right? Um, and because, I mean, it's more intuitive, we're used to it. We are using this 16 because um, it makes life a lot easier for you to interpret um, eight bit representation of the binary numbers, the ones and zeros, right? Um, and there's two obviously because we want to understand exactly how a machine gets to interpret these, these numbers, right? The things that go on behind the scenes. So, base 16, right? Like I said, uh, with base 16 um, or hexadecimal, you're dealing with um, a total of uh, 16 symbols, right? Zero to nine, and then A to F. This gives you 16, a total of 16. Um, and and so, so one of the reasons why, why you, people decided to introduce um, the alphabet in the notation is obviously because um, of the need to just deal with a single symbol, a single digit, right? You know that as you go beyond 10, you start dealing with two digits, right? Uh, beyond nine, I mean, so 10, 11. So instead of you dealing with 10, you say, you come up with the equivalent symbol that you're going to represent 10 with, which is A. Right, instead of you dealing with 15, you come up with the equivalent symbol that you're, um, you're going to use to represent, uh, to represent 15, which is F, right? So effectively what we're saying is, uh, you're dealing with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then A, B, C, D, um, E, and F, right? 
10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. A total of 16 digits. Right. Um, something that will soon become clear is this um, notion of a single, a single hexadecimal symbol digit representing four binary numbers. And we'll see this once we uh, have the discussion of, um, of uh, base two. Uh, but just keep this at the back of your mind. Very useful concept. Like I said, I think it's called a nib or something. Is it? What, what is it? Four, four, four bits is a nib, right? Or something. I don't know. <clears throat> right. Uh, and again, a reminder that this will come up a lot once we start dealing with QT spin here. So the question then is, uh, since we know um, the decimal number system, or base 10, and we have a fairly good, good enough understanding of how um, base 16 actually operates. The obvious question is, how exactly do we go about representing a number in, in let's say, base 10 uh, into base 16, right? If you find yourself in a situation where you want to represent that number, how do you go about doing that? Uh, or the other way around, right? How do you represent a number that is in, um, in, in, in base, base 16 into base 10, right? It's a simple thing here. Um, so for, for smaller numbers, so for numbers, for numbers less than 16, it's, it's a very straightforward process because all you have to do is uh, um, come up with, um, I guess, a mapping of the decimal equivalent of these, these 16 symbols for numbers less than 16, right? So if you're, if you're, if you're, converting, if you're converting a decimal, a hex, well, we hexadecimal, decimal. if you're converting a hexadecimal number that is uh, the equivalent of uh, 15 or less um, in base 10, then you just use this table, right? Um, and sadly, you'd have to memorize this somehow. So you see, you see a B, and you know it's going to be an 11, right? Um, because the alphabetical letters are only introduced for digits, for um, decimal numbers with more than two or more, more than two digits, one, one, more than one digit, anyway, right? Um, but the question is, what happens when you are dealing with with numbers that are more than 16, right? Just more numbers that are more than 16. Um, it turns out that there's a simple process of doing this. Um, all you do is, all you do is, you you get you get you get the hexadecimal number that you want to convert into decimal equivalent, um, and then you, you you kind of like. Um, so you get, you, you get your hexadecimal number, and then you count, you count the number of digits that that hexadecimal number has, and you represent, um, a, a, you, you represent a radix for each of those digits. So if you have a hexadecimal number that has three digits, then you're supposed to have a radix that is associated with each of those digits, right? Beginning from zero. What we're saying is, if you had a number, uh, let's say uh, 201, for instance, you come up with a representation in terms of powers of 16, obviously, for each of these digits, beginning zero. So 16 power zero, 16 power one, 16 power two, right? 16 power three, all the way up to 16 power n or something. Um, and then what you do is you multiply, right? the value with um, the result of, of, of uh, this computation here, um, uh, add it to this, add it to that, and then get the total result. You come up with the, the equivalent powers for the, for, the, for, the, for the number that you want to convert, right? Like 201. 201 means you're supposed to, to to associate one with 16 to the power zero, zero with 16 to the power one, two with 16 to the power two. You compute these numbers, and then you multiply each of these results with the corresponding hex number. And then you add the result afterwards, right? The result 
is going to be your equivalent what? Decimal number, right? So here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's a simple way of looking at this, right? Uh, let's start with a, a simple example. Since we said uh, we, can, we can only do a direct conversion for, well, we can, we can do a direct conversion for single digits. How would we convert FF using the method that we just say? I mean, you want us to look at another example here. Fine, maybe FF is a bit, let's say we had um, 10 to base 16 and somebody said convert this to um, equivalent decimal value. We said you come up with the equivalent powers is going to be what? We are converting zero and one here, right? Um, zero is associated with what? 16 to power zero. One is associated with 16 to power one, right? So what we do is we, we obviously, we have to compute this, which is what? What, what is the answer here? Yeah, what is the answer here? Right, and then we multiply, we multiply the result here, right? 16, zero, and then we, we add. So the answer is, I don't know if the answer is 16. So apparently 10 to base 16, 10, well, 10 to base 16 is equal to what? I, I don't know how you would uh, verify this, but I would myself, by going here and saying, what's the equivalent of uh, 10 in decimal, right? 16. And by the way, this is what you do in the, if, if there's a question in the exam, you go with your calculator and then you verify this, right? Although you get marks for showing the, the way you, the way you computed the, the, the result since you have calculators. No, but we just said that, we, are, we said, the question was, we started with an example of saying, we have 10 to base 16. What is, what is the equivalent of 10 base 16 in base 10? 10 base 16 is equal to 16 base 10. Now, now I hope uh, I hope no one is thinking, oh, then maybe every time you have 11 base 16, then that's no, right? Because of no. Maybe maybe let's let's try. Um, <laughs> here's, let's let's try um, let's try another number, right? Let's try let's try. I don't know, you should. Otherwise we've made a mistake, you should. Her question is... So what and 16, huh? It will be in 16. If you find this, how you found this right now? Yes. Find yeah. Now go back. Yeah, we can go back. We'll go back, we'll look at the process of going back. Okay. We're trying to understand the process of deriving a number in base 10 from base 16. Right? So here's, here's, here's another question for us, right? What if we wanted to... Call, yes, sir? So decimal notation is base 10. Hexadecimal is base 16. Whenever, and good question by the way, whenever you see some, whenever someone tells you, oh, convert this number to base 10 without telling you whether it's hexadecimal, just look at the base, right? So this is hexadecimal because it's, it says 10 base 16 here. This is base 10 because it's 16 base 16. Here's a question for us, right? What if we wanted to convert 333 in base 16 into base 10? What would we do? It's the same simple process, right? And as you are, as you are starting out, I would highly encourage you, they're probably, the math majors probably know um, better ways of doing this, but as you, are, as you are learning how to do these things, do it stepwise, right? Do it like I do because I'm slow here, so I, I have to, you know, do it stepwise. I know that I, I need to have uh, 16 power 0, 16 power 1, 16 power 2 here, right? Uh, so 16 power 0, 16 power 1, and 16 power 2. Um, and then I, I lay down all these numbers, right, exactly as they appear, and then I start computing um, 
these whole numbers stepwise. I first of all start by computing these powers, right? I know this is going to be one, this is going to be 16. What is, what is 16 times 16? I don't know. Sorry? Hmm. Millennia is 256, right? And then step number two is I multiply this by the number here, right? So the first one is quite easy. This is going to be three. Uh, what is 16 by three? Hmm. Wow. What is uh, 256 by three? 256 times three? 768. Okay, the people with calculators, and then we add these, right? What is the, the answer now? Seven, 768 plus 48 plus three would be? Sorry? 819, right? So what we are saying is that uh, 333 in hexadecimal is the equivalent of 819 in decimal format, right? Uh, and if you have a scientific calculator, you can confirm if what the nice madam computed there is the correct number, right? So we go here, my scientific calculator here has 333, or convert it to base 10, it's 819, right? Which is here. Right? So, so, so here's, here's the thing, right? We, we are starting out with um, a very simple way of converting these things, but it gets, it gets even more interesting when you start introducing, because in all these two examples we've looked at, we are dealing with, uh, with the, the symbols from zero to nine. What if uh, somebody came through to us and told us to say, convert uh, A to E? Base. I'm just making things up here, but convert convert A to E in base 16 to. Okay. I don't know. Convert this to base base 10. It's the same process, with one exception. You first of all, whenever you have symbols, right? The first thing you start out with is you identify if you're your hexadecimal representation has any symbols. You convert the symbols to the equivalent decimal notation. So in this case, we follow the same process here, uh, lay it down, right? We know that we, we need 16 to power zero, uh, 16 to power one, 16 to power two, right? And then we lay down the A, two, E, and perhaps, Perhaps, anyway, maybe because we're starting out here, you come up with the equivalent representation of the symbols, right? Perhaps in the next box here, you can just say, uh, E is what? 14. 14, apparently, I don't know. Two is what? Two. A is? Okay, and then you follow through with the same process where you evaluate the powers first, right? Um, A to E. So this is going to be zero, this is 16, um, and they told us this was 48 apparently, is it? Sorry? 256, thank you. The, the, the numbers are different somewhere. Okay, it's fine. Okay. <clears throat> right. Uh, okay, this is fine. Okay, so you do this, right? I was looking at the 48. I thought it was uh, the, the power of 16. But I was. So. Um, oh, thank you. Yes, there we go. You, you already, you've already figured out what's happening here. Uh, and then, and then what you're doing now is you're multiplying this by that, this by that, this by that, and then you add them. <laughs> no, but but wait a minute. Let's pause about the exam. Don't please don't don't start with the exam. It's not about the exam. You must understand this, right? Yes. If you look at the questions, those of you that have looked at the questions in the exam, some of the questions, the people were confused, right? Were associated with those IP addresses and they're they were carved in such a way that it was practical. 
right? So it's not like someone will ask you, oh, uh, convert this number into hexadecimal, no. One of the questions was, oh, this is an IP address. What would be the equivalent of this IP address in, let's say, uh, hexadecimal, for instance? Right, so you need, need, there's a bit of thinking that is involved and a whole bunch of concepts that are associated with whatever question you'd be asked. So, uh, so 14 by one is 14, I don't know what, two by, two by 16 is 32, 10 by 256 is 250, and then you just add these numbers, right? And then you get your answer. This should be fairly intuitive now, I mean, those examples are pretty much um, exhaustive. You notice that the slides have, uh, hello, hi. Can you give us an example of turning the 10 numbers to the 10? Yes. Yeah, sure. It's, yeah, that's what we're going to, right? Yeah, so we, we will. I mean, hopefully people understand this. I mean, so you can pretty, pretty much easily work with even larger numbers, right, if you wish to much, much larger numbers, and in fact, in fact, what we expect people to do is to be able to convert, sorry to take you back, but to be able to convert, if a question was to come and they ask you to say, what is, uh, what is this in base 10, right? <laughs> no, okay, maybe not, no, not base 10, maybe. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, no, I'm just joking. Um, but but if, <laughs> if if somebody was to ask you to say, can you can you represent this is IPv6 right? Represent this IPv6 representation of this IP address into decimal notation. You should be able to do this. All you'd have to do is you look at these different segments here and then you convert them to decimal. Wow. Sorry. No, the slash is, you, you'd ignore the slash. Normally when you ask such a question, it's not like the slash won't be there. Um, it, it, it spells out certain information associated with the network itself. It has nothing to do with IP address. Yeah, if a question like this was to come, it wouldn't have the slash. <laughs> um, but when you start doing subnetting, obviously slashes will, will be introduced in some of these computations. <clears throat> okay, so, so the question now is, uh, how then do we, do we go about converting, going the other way around? Now that we know how to convert uh, 10 in hexadecimal format into the equivalent decimal format, how would we convert 16 into, into base, base 16? 16 base 10 into, into, into base 16. Or how would we convert uh, 819 a decimal number 819 into base 16 or into hexadecimal format, right? It turns out that it's a, it's a very a fairly intuitive and easy process. Um, and please, at this point in time, I expect the math majors especially to, to, to tell us about some of the um, better ways or more effective ways of converting numbers, right? I'm just showing you one method. The, it's possible that there are other methods of converting uh, these, these, uh, these bases, right, into equivalent notations. Is it, is it not so? This is not the only method, right? Yeah. Who's doing maths here? I don't know. <laughs> there should be, there's bound to be another method. This is, come on, it can't be this alone. No, no but why are you being spokesperson for them? Now, <laughs> okay, so, Repeated, uh, so th converting, f converting from, from, um, from, oh, this is it. Converting from decimal to hexadecimal is very easy. You use uh, repeated division. It's the easiest method I know of. It's a method I used when I was in primary school myself, uh, when we were taught how to convert these numbers. Um, you just use repeated division, where you, you start out by, um, you take note of the number, right? Can we start with a simpler one? Let's say, let's say we want to convert, um, let's say we want to convert 16 into, 16 into, uh, to, to decimal, right, to hexadecimal format, right? We use repeated division, right? So using 16 as an example, 
we use repeated divi division in, in, in such a way that every time you divide, you keep track of the remainder, right? Um, the remainder and the result of dividing. Right? So you start with 16, um, and then you use repeated division, start by, uh, well, 16, I guess this is 16. So you, you divide, you divide the decimal number by 16, take note of the result and the remainder. <laughs> okay. Um, what number do you want us to use? Sorry? 819. Okay, sure. Okay, so we divide 819 by, by 16. Question is, uh, what is um, 819 divided by 16? You chose the number, it's, uh, sorry? Can we start with a slightly smaller number so that it makes sense? Okay, not, no, we can't use 14. We can't use 14 because 14 requires a direct mapping. 20, fine. We'll, we'll come back to 819. 20. What is 16 into 20? Okay. What's the remainder? What's um, 16 into 4? Remainder? <laughs> All right, so the answer then is what? 41 by 16. Apparently, I don't know. Well, there's no point in using 14 because it's a direct mapping. What is 14 is just what? 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. A, B, C, D, E. So you don't have to divide. It's just D. Um, so we are saying uh, 20. Huh? Oh, okay. Sorry? Everything after 16. 14, not 4.1. Everything, huh? Everything after 16 is not a direct mapping. Yes, yes, because we, sorry, 1, 4, not, not 41, 1, 4 here. Yes, everything after, everything after 15. Sorry? Because 16 has no representation on the, we, we, only, we can only work with what? 16 digits, right? 0 through 0 through F. Yeah. 1, 4. Yes? Okay. Uh, Oh, you understand? Okay, okay 819 apparently. Let's start, uh, let's, let's, let's close up with uh, the 819. What is 16 into 819? Sorry? Come on, I know you have a calculator. I need to rush somewhere, but sorry? 51? 51, are you sure? Okay, so it's, it's 51, right? What is the remainder? If, if, if you've forgotten how to calculate the remainder, the easiest way to do is, if you're saying, if, if you're saying it's 51, multiply 51 by 16 and then subtract it from 18. Okay, three. What is 16 into 51? What's the remainder? No, it can't be zero, come on. <laughs> You're joking now. <laughs> what is 16 into three? 
You remember this? Yes. Right, so. Yeah, so I'm sorry. So yeah, this is the thing. Uh, that when, you're, when you're dividing, right? It turns out that repeated division is going to come up when you start looking at binary numbers as well. When you're dividing, it's, it's, it can be a bit confusing to use the, <laughs> the, the numbers after the decimal point. The easiest thing to do is get the whole number before the decimal point, multiply it by 16, and then subtract the result from so that you get the, the difference. Yeah. Top down. Top down. Where? Which one? Yeah, but but uh, I, I did. Uh, I did say that it was a mistake. It was not 41, it was 14. <laughs> hey, practice with the smaller numbers, right? Practice with the smaller numbers. Try out the smaller numbers. Like, you can try, uh, here's, here's, here's a question, because I know 32 is a thing. So I'll say, what is 33, right? In in base 16. 16 into this is what? Two times, right? Remember one. Thank you. <laughs> Guys? Sorry? Where? Okay, so, so so fine. If people are getting confused, we shall modify the slide so that our table that shows repeated division will clearly state to say the remainder goes here, remainder, right, and then resolve. Fine. But practice, yeah. Hey, Ed, excuse me, there's a nice question, right? Is it okay if... As FF. No, no. No, no, no. You, you know the easiest way of confirming if what you've done is whether what, what you've done is correct is doing what? Do another div convert it to the go back and see if you can convert FF to decimal. You notice that what is F? It's 15, right? So 15 is going to be 15 times 1, 15 times 16. This will not give you 30. So you can't. I see what you're doing. No. <laughs> yeah. I'll see you when you see me. I'm away until the other week. Yes, hi. Yeah. I wanted to uh, enable to upload the result because you just speak. <laughs> uh, I'm talking about you. The one who said that it's kind of You lost all of them? Yeah, when, when going back home, I lost them. Why? I tried to do that before. Why? Because well, someone was killing the room. Lost them. <laughs> okay. So there's no problem. There could be a problem for you. What are you going to do if you discover that some of your results were not entered? How are you going to prove that we're actually entered? Uh, but I sent on mood uh, uh, all of, Okay, so I'll just get a screenshot of mood. Then keep it. Is that okay? Okay. okay. Um, yeah, I guess so. But the process that is going to be a take home on Friday. Yeah. What time did you say it's supposed to be uploaded? When was it supposed to take it out? Well, it's, it's going to be available on Friday itself. 2359, ah. and then it will be due on Monday, 2359. All right, I was late that day. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, when it comes to Hi, Mr. identifying another computer, I say it uses IP addresses, right? Mm -hmm. What about Bluetooth? When you use Bluetooth? What about Bluetooth? It's usually they, they identify device names. Sorry? They device name, like the location. Yeah, that's probably like the MAC address or something. The device name identifies the MAC address. If you notice the screenshot I had, 
there's another funny number that is in hexadecimal format. That's your MAC address. Tunica identifies the hardware, the machine itself, the computer. Yeah. So meaning it identifies the device name as well as the address. Yes. Oh. Yeah. I thought maybe you were specific only to uh, uh, no. I mean, when you're connecting via Bluetooth, I mean, it's a wireless connection, so it's through a network. Right? Yeah. Miss Maka, hi. Okay. Okay. 